uh, we have General Walter Bay. Good afternoon. My name is Jen Arnold with NVIDIA, and I would like to thank you all so much for these to joining us today to hear these incredible leaders to discuss their perspectives on the military metaverse. I am so fortunate to be joined by Lieutenant General Marie Gervais, Deputy Commanding General, Chief of Staff, United States Army Training and Doctrine Command, Major General Heather Pringle, Commander Air Force Research Laboratory, Air Force Material Command, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Technology Executive Officer, supporting both the United States Air Force and the United States Space Force. And Dr. Lisa Costa, the Chief Technology and Innovation Officer of the United States Space Force. Thank you all for being here today. I fully expect this to be a very passionate, very exciting, very creative conversation. We will have a Q&A at the end, so please be prepared with your questions. I've been a part of the ITSIG family for over 18 years and had the honor of being your conference chair last year, which was one of the highlights of my career. I've also had the pleasure of standing at the first medical simulation special event the first data science track, which included our first ITSIC hackathon with TRADOC, General Dervais. Uh, it was very exciting. And now I believe one of our most exciting times now and initiative to date is ITSICverse. So I hope you all had the opportunity to visit the show floor and meet with industry to talk about the metaverse capabilities that we're showcasing here at the show. Uh, I would ask that you go by the multiverse training environment in the Brightline booth, which is powered by NVIDIA's own Omniverse. But the programs list all of these organizations, and we're here to learn, we're here to talk, and we're basically here to really understand what the metaverse means to our community. So I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Maddie, if you may. There they are, on the left and on the right. I'm sorry, I was looking up behind me, but let's give them a hand for bringing everyone together. And as I mentioned in the show daily on Monday, industry and government are together, defining what the metaverse means to us and what it means to our mission. I know you'll hear today that there are a number of definitions and what the metaverse means to each of us. So I would like to dive right in and let's get started and hear about these amazing leaders' perspective. So General Gervais, we'll start here. If you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about yourself and what the metaverse means to you and your mission, please. Okay, um, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, excellent. I think he gave me a thumbs up, but I can't see any of you, <laughs> just for the record. <laughs> just manage expectations here. Hey, so um, currently I'm serving as the Deputy Commanding General Chief of Staff for the United States Army Training and Doctrine Command. And I mean, we have kind of everything. We kind of build the Army, the ar architecture of the Army, and we work with Army Futures Command and all of our stakeholders, especially as we're delivering capability. But I think the thing that I would like for you to know that kind of gives me a unique perspective is I had the opportunity to serve as the Deputy Commanding General for Combined Armed Center Training out at Fort Leavenworth. And in that job, that is the place where we really bring together all of our collective ability to train combined arms and with our joint and allied partners. And so it was in that job that gave me a very unique perspective in terms of what we needed to do as we were not just today, but moving forward, especially as we took a look at multi-domain operations and the future operating environment. And so in that job, that led to a second job, which was um, when the Army stood up its cross-functional teams it had a focus on six modernization priorities, so I was afforded the opportunity and very blessed to serve as the first cross-functional team um, director for the synthetic training environment. It was probably one of the first times that the United States Army has actually taken a look at training in the beginning and not as uh, kind of like an afterthought. 
And so I kind of share all of that with you because it gave me a very unique perspective of some of the challenges that we had, not just training with ourselves inside of our army, all the way from a, a squad, all the way up to our division and corps, but with our joint partners, with our allies and partners. And so in there, we identified some gaps mm -hmm. and we said, you know, the metaverse, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I would say that we have been thinking about something, the metaverse type concept for quite some time because of the limitations that we had in our training environment and where we needed, we knew we needed to go. So metaverse has a lot of definitions, a lot of different ways to think about it. And it's all predicated in, in my view, really on what is your use case or what is the user experience that you're trying to achieve. So when you think about that, and I think about metaverse, I, I think about it from, you know, you have what are no, I would classify as single metaverse environments, right? So we all have specific use cases, specific things we're trying to achieve or user experiences. So those are kind of all individually out there. But when you talk about what I call the big metaverse, right? What I think that is, is there's some common denominators among all of those. And that is the ability to bring all of those single environments that are virtual 3D. How do you bring those together that has the ability to m ensure that they're interconnected, there's common data, there's a c common open architecture that has common terrain with standard protocols so that we can all operate you know, seamlessly at scale with what we tried it to do. And so as we took a look at it in the United States Army, it was called the synthetic training environment. And we actually started pretty simple, right? Quite frankly, we just wanted what we did in our live training environment, our virtual training environment, and also our constructed, which is our big war games for our training division, uh, brigade divisions and corps, hire staffs with our joint partners and our coalition partners. Quite frankly, all we wanted those to do was to be able to have the same data, the same architecture, be able to utilize the terrain the same way. Because quite frankly, we were spending lots of money, lots of time to be able to make it so that they could be you know, interoperable and we could train from the smallest level all the way up to brigade um, and core and higher, right? So we started very simple from a training perspective. Because I'll say this, the, there's lots of things that the metaverse is going to do as we looked at it. But we started with training. And we started with training because, you know, a piece of material is very important. But the thing that gives, I would say, the Army and our sister services and our coalition partners, the thing that gives us the asymmetrical threat, um, ability and edge is our ability from a training, a leader development perspective, and improving human performance. That is what makes us great. And that's why I'm most excited about the applications that we will have from the, the metaverse perspective from a training perspective. Um, perspective. But I got to tell you, this journey has been incredible because as we started doing some of the work on the STI, I, I classify it as this. I had all kinds of people trying to put an ornament on the Christmas tree to the fact that we almost wilted, right? Because when you looked at it, you could use the same environment from a modeling and simulation perspective. You could use it from a modeling perspective to help with acquisition and design and prototyping. You could look at it from a testing experimentation perspective. And then we even saw how we could use it for recruiting. And oh, by the way, that's my job right now um, at TRADOC and we're very challenged in it. So we're looking for more ways to use it in recruiting. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you looked at it, it was the tip of the iceberg. And I said that maybe three or four years when I was here. Mm -hmm. We are at the tip of the iceberg and we're really not sure what we have, but we're about to find out. So I'll just kind of pause there. Hopefully that answers yeah, the that question. That is perfect, and we are about to find out. General Pringle, if you would. Uh, well, thank you for having me. It's really an honor to be with uh, such distinguished guests and uh, premieres in this field. So I've been at the research lab. It's the Air Force Research Lab, which is headquartered in Dayton. We have laboratories all around the United States, uh, 12 locations, but also around the world where we partner with uh, academia as well as industry to take risks to solve warfighter problems in air and space and deliver technology, uh, accelerate technology to the field. 
So uh, in, in that regard, uh, the metaverse or concepts about the metaverse, um, I couldn't agree more uh, with General Gervais because it is something that we have been involved with, we've been thinking about for quite some time. In fact, uh, when I was a major, which was many moons ago, <laughs> I was actually doing some research in this area and it's certainly evolved since then and it's really an exciting field. And what's most important is how do you use it? So General Gervais mentioned uh, it's very helpful for training, but we also want to think about it for mission rehearsal. So when warfighters go step out into the field, uh, day one of the fight, they know what they've seen, they've encountered all the possible scenarios that can be thrown their way, and it is about training, but they already know what they're doing. They've practiced what uh, the con-ops are, and they've worked out all the kinks. And of course, from a science and technology perspective, we're also in the interested in the metaverse for pushing the state of the art and technology. You're not limited to the real world. So if we're looking at uh, training or mission rehearsal in space, we're going to want to think about other types of physics challenges. And I won't get it too much into the space uh, aspect because I know Dr. Costa will get there, but uh, it's really important. So when I think about how we're using it in the laboratory, there are a couple really good examples that we have ongoing today, and then I hope a little later we talk about what's coming next. So today we look at things like pilot vehicle interfaces, and so how can we build a better simulation so that pilots know and are able to interact with? I think a number of you are working in this space as well. When I was walking on the floor, I saw a lot of really great examples. Um, and a lot of them really involve commercial technologies as well. So we see this as a partner between the, a partnership between the government and industry. And one, one area that we try to pursue, both with pilot vehicle interfaces and others, is leveraging commercial technologies for military needs. So how can we take what's already been created for potentially a commercial use and then adapt it for our, for our needs? And there are a lot of great ways that we can do that. Um, we also have uh, some simulations and metaverse technologies where we're trying to understand something that might be dangerous or something that you don't get a lot of exposure to, so uh, laser dazzling and understanding the implications on the human visual system. That's a very um, real threat for our pilots who are flying in airplanes. So we want to be able to give them tools so that they can adapt and still get the mission done despite that uh, technology. And we even have uh, in our 7-Eleventh Human Performance Wing. So the laboratory has an amazing group of scientists and technologists representing all kinds of technical expertise, and medicine is another one. And I think we have 80 different medical career fields uh, in the lab as well. And one of the areas that they look at building uh, more robust and higher fidelity simulation is for aeromedical evacuation. And they have, uh, they've, cre they've transformed decommissioned aircraft and they've built in some uh, simulations to train these medical professionals on their craft in a, the most intense environment ever. And they've added in um, all aspects of sensory, um, you know, they're trying to overload the senses with sound with smoke and smell mm -hmm. and a lot of no, you know a lot of noise so it's really a high pressure environment but it allows them to be at the top of their game so that they don't skip a beat when um, someone's life is depending on their skills and then lastly i'll just mention that uh, talking about this multidisciplinary approach to uh, the metaverse right you don't want to just focus in on one area or have it be uh, limited to one uh, sensory um, uh, modality, right? Like vision is yeah. the primary one that we tend to think about. And so 
when we're talking about humans interacting with these machines and environments, how can we better adapt the environment to what the skill level is or the cognitive load of the operator interacting? So if you think about back in the 1940s and B-17s, you had the gunner who had to cram into that little uh, area, right, the tail gunner, and it was not a machine or technology that adapted to the human. They said, okay, you can't be taller than such and such height. You have to cram the human into that system. Well, what we want to do is we kind of want to reverse, um, reverse that equation so that the system, the metaverse, the technology is adapting to the human. So how can we do this? We're going to measure their cognitive load, their stress, pupil dilation, their heart rate, temperature, all, all types of um, physiological, neurological, behavioral, and cognitive inputs so that it's adapting to what that human needs at that point in time of that mission and help them get to mission accomplishment. So a lot of exciting areas mm -hmm. to pursue. And um, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll stop there and wait for some questions. I think that's a very interesting concept because oftentimes we look at modifying ourselves for the metaverse, modifying and leveraging the metaverse and the systems there to benefit us. Yes. Thank you, General Pringle. Dr. Costa? Well, thank you. Um, and I think we are um, actually conducting a dazzling um, <laughs> you know, a experiment of our own here. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to move up a little bit, um, uh, but um, uh, I couldn't be more excited about a topic, to be honest with you. Um, when I got to Space Force, uh, it, it was apparent that, you know, if you saw the keynote, um, I talked about we have the fact, we have this issue of having the smallest force and the largest AOR. So how are you going to cover this you know, amount of space in terms of avoiding collision, understanding uh, what's happening in space, at what levels, uh, being able to operate um, different um, assets in space, and sometimes they're ours, sometimes there are multinational partners, and sometimes they're industries. So that is a, that's a huge challenge for a very small force. And Spaceverse, which is what we have coined, it's our space metaverse equivalent. And a little, little fun fact here, um, when we came up with Spaceverse, we decided we were gonna trademark it because we were concerned that a company might take it, trademark it, and then you know we would no longer kind of control that messaging that was going on. And um, so we trademark it, and literally the next week there was an um, article, I think, in The Economist about Elon Musk is going to create the space first. And the Air Force lawyers got to send a cease and desist <laughs> order to <laughs> Elon. And I said, how fun is that, sir? <laughs> so. So our four star was pleasantly surprised at how forward leaning we were. <laughs> but um, uh, you know, to us as a small service, we are entering our third year of existence. And what we focused on in the first two years really is kind of standing up our verticals, meaning we have um, our space warfighter analysis center uh, that does force design. We have STARCOM that General Bratton talked about um, yesterday, which is the training um, uh, arm of Space Force. And they're responsible also for developing TTPs in space, right? Um, space has been benign mostly since uh, you know we, we entered space, but uh, it has become uh, increasingly contested, and, and how do you operate in a contested environment in space? So developing TTPs and, and doctrine for that. And uh, of course, we have our acquisition arm. Um, we have three of them, actually. And then we have um, uh, Spock, which is our operations. 
So how do you kind of now horizontally integrate those functions? Because we, you know, and I absolutely agree with General Gervais, um, our view, of, at least, of what Spaceverse is, is probably smaller in size, but more of that larger ecosystem that helps us move from acquisition, design of an asset, modeling that asset in orbit, um, uh, being able to then model how that asset could possibly work with other assets that are in different orbits, and then uh, being able to hand that over to training, development of doctrine, and then move things back, right? This is a non-linear systems dynamic model, right, where we're kind of doing feedback loops all along this process, and then we get to operations. Um, and think of a basically a switch where you're moving from, okay, I'm in using simulated data now, and now I'm just flipping the switch and I'm, I'm using real data. So uh, I'm, I'm operationally using the system the exact way in which I train. So again, train the way we fight, fight the way we train. And so that to us is critically important and I just wanna highlight that um, the work that General Pringle's team is doing in digital engineering, absolutely critical for us um, as, as they're gonna be helping us put our strategy together, but then also the work on cognition, and I can't stress this enough, our folks who are doing space operations are doing 12-hour shifts, and they're sitting there looking at four screens of six windows each, right? So there are 24 of them, and they're just like going between them, and it's text messages. So think about that. Think about the cognitive load that causes on an individual for 12 hours. We've got to come up with ways in which we have, um, we reduce cognitive load and we increase learning. So there, there's some basic facts about where we're going and why we're, we're doing it. Um, gamers are 25X, 20, not 25%, 25X, um, more likely to identify an object that they have seen under stress that they've seen before. So in other words, if you're doing anomaly detection, you're trying to do collision avoidance, um, there's a threat, they are 25 times more likely uh, to identify that uh, than someone who is not a gamer. The um, learning of facts, right? I think uh, General Bratton talked about the fact that we, we bring in a lot of STEM folks. But the folks that we do bring in and they don't have that STEM background or are joint forces that don't have necessarily STEM backgrounds, we need to be able to um, help them understand what the effects from space can be. And so if you, if you provide a fact to someone, you're 22 times more likely to remember that fact if it's told to you in a story versus just kind of you know blurted out as remember this. So there are really key um, quantitative uh, return on investment uh, aspects of uh, the metaverse that we're really looking forward to. And the great thing is Yes, as you walk around the floor, you see all of this incredible work, and that's exactly what we intend to do, is to leverage the work that all of you are doing out there. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Costa. I truly appreciate the flipping the switch, because I think for many, many years, we've looked at how are we leveraging the systems for both training and operational. I think in the past, we've even referred to it as the holy grail. So if, if we are getting to that point, which I know we're all so excited about, I just think that is incredible as part of the evolution. Uh, General Gervais, you mentioned the training application. Could you talk a little bit more about that, what you're seeing 
Yeah, um, so what I will tell you what, what I'm seeing is, is absolutely amazing um, because, you know, in, in 2016, when I um, became the Deputy Commanding General for CACP, and we really started looking at what was our synthetic training environment vision, um, you know, I stood right here and said, hey, you know, here's what we're trying to accomplish with STE and, you know, and why we're trying to do it and what, what the benefit was going to be. And, you know, quite frankly, threw out the challenge that said, hey, we can use the unbelievable uh, advancements that we are seeing, you know, from both in the virtual and gaming uh, arena, the telecommunications, and all of it coming together. We had the opportunity now to really revolutionize the way that the Army was training and create an environment that not only could it replicate all domains, we even thought about space um, back then, <laughs> because the challenge we had is that we could do it in some type of environments, but we couldn't do it in all, and some of it we had to white card, some of it we actually had to have OCs out there, and that training wasn't realistic. Nor could we change the training. We couldn't even change the terrain that we needed to bring into our simulations so that um, you know we could really rehearse, getting to your point, train and rehearse before we ever had to go do it. Mm -hmm. And so it started pretty simple, right? Just kind of focus on the training aspect of this. And when they stood up the cross-functional teams and we came down here and threw out the challenge that said, hey, we need to really get after this. And our environments that we create, not only does it have to represent the domains that we're gonna have to operate, but it, ca it has to have the realism. And that's one of the things about the metaverse. Because you know, you gotta have that ability you know, that environment has got to create the fact that you have got to feel like you are present. You are in that environment, it is realistic, it is providing that sense to you. And then you have the ability to interact with that environment. That's one of those other common denominators of a metaverse, the big metaverse, to be able to do that, right? And I'm not talking about interact, meaning I can buy something, because you can right now, we can buy stuff. Mm -hmm. But when we were thinking about it was, how do you have an interaction and a reaction, right? How do you create something, as we used to call it, how do you create like a mega city, because we know we're gonna have to operate in there, that provides the same level and patterns of life that mm -hmm. you, would, uh, you would have to, as a soldier on the ground, have to understand and interact and what would that dynamic be mm -hmm. in that environment? So those were all of the things that we were really thinking about trying to, to get after to improve human performance because, you know, former SecDef Mattis, his thing was, how do I create 25 bloodless battles mm -hmm. before I ever have to execute the first battle? Because see, it's not that I would have, it gets back to your point, maybe I've been able to change some scenarios with enough variation that through those 25 reps and sets, you know, number one, you kind of recognize what needs to happen. You get the reps and sets and you're able to hone your cognition skills. You're able to hone decision making. Also, you build trust in your leaders to those that are um, on their leading, right? So we were really focused on how do you do that? So what we've seen, and it's absolutely amazing, and it's because of you know, the challenge that I threw out to this community and others, mm -hmm. that right now, if you think about it, training-wise, we started focused on training, but we have seen success in so many different areas that have already started to materialize. Now, they're not perfect yet, mm -hmm. but the challenge we threw out there has allowed things to start and accelerate faster than we ever would have done it in our previous process. Because the Army's cross-functional teams were stood up because we were trying to streamline our acquisition process. The typical process where we said, well, we have a requirement, we kind of put it on a piece of paper, we give it to our, our acquisition partner who try defines it, and then 17 years later, I go, hey, I asked for a cupcake, but, but I got a cake, right? <laughs> I mean, and the first time a soldier sees it. So we were trying to come in, and how do we do prototyping? How do we put it in the hands of soldiers much sooner so that we can get feedback? Because see, here's the thing. When a soldier sees value in what it is, and it helps them do their job, and they're using it, and we're training as we fight, then you know you're onto something. And so a couple things from a training perspective, where are we right now? I mean, you know, the integrated visual augmentation system was really started because we wanted to train um, in a heads-up display, and we wanted to provide the close combat force 
with an ability just like the fighter pilots, right? All that information, so how do we do it? What we found was that now could provide a train, rehearse, and fight capability, not just a training one, because we were so used to providing a training capability as like an appendage, right? Mm -hmm. But when a soldier uses it every single day, it's part of what they do, and they know it's gonna help them when they go and they deploy, and it's real, then I think then you see that you have it. So the integrated visual augmentation system I is under development, and I will tell you we have pushed that, and it's not perfect yet, but it is already a game changer. I will tell you in the first couple tu soldier touch points, the soldier feedback was, we will take this right now. Because the thing about some of the metaverse and some of the things that we were doing, you know, visualization. Visualization is so key, right? It breaks down barriers. The metaverse will break down barriers, right? You will come in, now everybody can kind of see the same thing, maybe experience something similar, see how people react, and it kind of helps get to shared understanding. So the integrated visual augmentation system um, is one that I would highlight that went from something that started as training but now has went to an operational capability and we're still working on it. The other one is One World Terrain, 3D terrain. Now, I, I will tell you that <laughs> I was very surprised because all we wanted to do was get our simulators all able to use the same terrain. And I know you're laughing, you're going, hey, that sounds easy. <laughs> okay, but our s current simulations, I will tell you, you know, we, our air and ground wouldn't talk to each other if, if you know, for example, Ukraine and we're deploying forces um, to um, Poland and other areas in, Euro in the European theater, we would have had to take that terrain, mail it back, and then spend six months trying to get it to work in our units back here. One world terrain, 3D terrain, now it started as training. We put it in the hands of soldiers and they started using it at our live training centers. Then they started taking it into theater and started capturing that terrain and sending it back so other units that were coming forward with it. And then on top of that, you know, as we looked at it, then it went from training to now they said, we need this operationally. Mm -hmm. They started using it operationally and now, and, but they said, they said, General, if we can't target off of it, to include our Air Force partner sold us that, if you can't target off of it, it's not useful. Well, guess what? It's very close to being able to uh, be used for all types of targeting. And that's a training environment, something training that now has crossed a span. Right? And so you, what you're seeing is the ability of this technology and the way we're thinking about it with an open architecture, with common standards, common protocols. You know, if I had my phone, I'd hold it up, right? Because <laughs> that's a metaverse type capability already, right? We're trying to get like a metaverse capability for training that, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in a live environment, it doesn't matter if you're in a virtual environment or a constructive environment. All that data is being shared. All that data is the same. And then all of a sudden you got your testers that are looking at that data, your experimenters, you got your war gamers. You know, if you just think about it, it's endless opportunities, which is exciting. So, you know, we kind of focused on the virtuals first because mm -hmm. we knew um, we could get our ground um, platforms, our air platforms working. Um, and then the second part was to bring in for a, um, an immersive uh, soldier capability, but getting to next gen constructive. So to me, as we're starting to do this, we're already seeing the utility of it. I think what I would offer in this case, right? You can't eat the, metaverse is big. W okay, if we're expecting like it all to be here like tomorrow, no. We're watching, watch incrementally what's happening. Look at the use cases, because you can tap into it right now. It is value added right now, and it's already making a difference. And then just keep expanding, um, and it's going to be amazing, I think, where it's going to take us. That is an incredible use case, because I will tell you, General Gervais, the conversations I'm having, we're struggling with that. Because the metaverse is a very big thing, and, and what is it? How do we define it? What does it mean to us? But to your point, incrementally, and you just talked about the evolution of where we are today, where we were three or four years ago when you started this, is incredible. So I think we need to keep that in mind as we go forward, and it's not perfect, but we've gotta get things out there and get them in the hands so that we're using them. So thank you, that was a wonderful message. General Pringle, you talked about the future of AFRL and where you're taking this. As you look into the future of the military metaverse, 
what else are you doing that you would like to expand on from an AFRL perspective as you work through your digital transformation? Well, I think uh, digital transformation is a key element to be able to achieve any, any type of instantiation of the metaverse. And so uh, we are working with a whole host of folks and organizations uh, through our own digital transformation, whether it's to achieve um, faster research uh -huh. or low friction business operations. Uh, I think that's something everybody would want, especially in the government. <laughs> and uh, the other thing that we're really focused on is streamlining transitions. So how can we um, digitally transform ourselves to make achieve all those goals? Um, in the faster research realm, one of the things that I think is really important to the, the metaverse are the, is the digital thread that we have the opportunity to pull from the training environment, the data associated with that, and pay it forward as these technologies transition and go to scale. And so a digital thread obviously is a representation, a one-to-one -one representation of something in the world. And I'm sure that's really familiar uh, to this audience, but I think um, it's something that we're trying to instantiate across all our technologies, and I'll put a Shout out for uh, the folks that are doing engine work, for example. They're building a digital thread, a physics-based model uh, of a rotating detonation engine and how that might operate. Uh, so we're doing it, uh, it's, it's a little more natural to do it with technologies where you do have physics-based models, but we're also, I started to allude to this earlier, but we're starting to do this with humans as well. How can you build the human digital twin and how is that going to interoperate in this environment with the, this environment and uh, getting the models right? So um, when I hear General Dravet talk about how critical the metaverse can be to training, we have to keep in mind we don't want any negative training and we want to appropriately trust the system for the level of capability that it offers. So as we're on this journey, we don't want to overtrust, uh, and we don't want to undertrust it either because there's a lot of capability that it could enhance uh, our operations. Uh, and then lastly, I'll mention, uh, in addition to a technological um, digital twin, a human digital twin, we are even looking at this in terms of facilities and can we build so a metaverse to better instantiate some of our research facilities. So, for example, we have a rocket lab out at Edwards Air Force Base, California. It's been around since the 1950s and 60s, and it builds rocket engines to launch into space, and it's been doing this for decades. But, uh, and they have a lot of models, a lot of blueprints, a lot of paper and pen, but what we're trying to do is better optimize the use of these facilities by building its own facility digital twin. And how do we better manage the data between all the different engine test stands and what are the results that we're looking for? It's, it is an opportunity that we partner with multiple uh, small and large businesses where they can come in and um, also use those test stands. They need to know what the capabilities are, what they can expect to get out of it, and how to import those results into their own uh, capability development. So lots of aspects that we're working on to build components that support uh, the big metaverse that General Gervais is talking about. So from a human digital twin mm -hmm. to a structural digital twin, to a potential Earth 2 digital twin. There you go. Something to consider. Thank you, General Pringle. And, and I, ex absolutely, of course, which, which is per, and I know everyone, I loved your trademark story. I, I think that, I know we're all gonna repeat that. Could you, Dr. Costa, could you talk to us a little bit more about Spaceverse and your vision of that? You are the first trademarked verse, I believe. <laughs> Wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, uh, you know, fundamentally, the reason that we are going in the direction of, of space first 
is because all of the investment. Um, now, I, I've been coming to EdSec since 1994, and I will tell you that uh, about five or six years ago, I came to EdSec, and I was, I was a little disappointed because I kind of saw a lot of the same tech, right, that I saw, you know, years ago. Uh, you know, models, simulations that didn't talk to one another, things that were still very um, cartoonish as opposed to video game. and I, I'm a gamer, so um, uh, I, I was like, you know, wh where is that interface, right? But walking around yesterday was like night and day. Um, the transformation if you, ha if you haven't been going to ITSEC, you know, and you're just kind of exposed to it, you're like, oh, this is all cool. It's like, well, this did not exactly happen overnight. This took decades, but, um, you know, you start by starting, right? And we will build out pieces and parts, and then we will start filling in where there's nothing. And that's the key. I mean, you know, with our joint partners, I don't want to have to recreate a land battle. I don't want to have to recreate a, um, you know, an amphibious landing. I want, though, to be able to connect our space effects models to the Navy's models, to the Army's models, so that we can um, understand what we each bring to the table because we all have our, you know, different languages. And when we come together, we oftentimes don't speak the same language. So I think the space verse or the metaverse writ large can help us to develop a common lexicon. And I'll give an example. Um, Kids today, right, um, and it's not just kids, our, our recruits, um, in fact, 86% of our airmen and our guardians, and that's a lot, 86% of our airmen and guardians under the age of 34 consider themselves gamers. So they self-describe as gamers. So they've been spending decades learning how to navigate terrains, different environments, uh, be able to cause different effects that physics wouldn't necessarily allow them to do. They have connected via gaming networks to be able to uh, work with other people all over the globe and at different age levels, right? We've got 12-year-olds playing Call of Duty with literally 28-year-olds who are sitting in an MWR tent in Afghanistan, right? At the same time, and they're doing ops together. So these are important skills. Why would we want to say, okay, that was nice, now forget all about that, and now we're gonna give you these individualized you know, flight simulators, you're gonna learn how to fly one thing, that's it, and, um, you know, and then you're just gonna have to imagine the rest of the part. <laughs> and we do that, we do that today. Um, so I think there's, there's great value in meeting our folks um, where they're coming in uh, to the degree that, and if you're a gamer, some of you, not all of you, but actually how many of you here are gamers? Just to kind of get, oh, pretty, a lot. There we go. There's a, a lot more than when I ask um, military crowds necessarily, but um, or senior military crowds. But if you're a gamer, you pro you've probably downloaded apps that help you develop, you know, skins and different, you know, um, uh, artifacts, right, for games that you play a lot. We want our guardians to be able to do the same thing. We want our guardians to co-create the, the environment in which they're operating. Um, 
you know, I came from special operations. When special ops folks, and they're inherently joint, right, get together, they will rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and they'll, they'll tweak and they'll plan and they'll rehearse again. We want the same thing, but we're not developing, quote, muscle memory per se, we're, we're developing cognitive muscle memory. And we're recruiting for cognitive diversity. So now think about that. To take those two concepts and put them together. We're recruiting for cognitive diversity and now we're trying to also create this cognitive muscle memory in terms of seeing anomalies, coming up with different approaches that we not ever come up with before because again, space was benign and not contested. Those are two very powerful things when you start putting them together. And for us, that's exactly where we want space first to take us. We want the value of our very diverse guardians coming together and coming up with new ideas, new tactics, techniques, and procedures, new doctrine, so that they give a lot more option space to senior decision makers and allow them to prevent a big war from breaking out. We, we want to focus on keeping space free um, and open and navigable. We will be ready if that is not the case. And the Space Force will help us be ready. But the focus is on coming up with those, those new ideas for ensuring that space does remain peaceful. And creating it together. Exactly. Open standards, open, I think we said language is a minute ago, that we can actually are all real time creating and interoperating together. Right, and you know what I wanted to just you know emphasize is look, um, it takes me ten minutes to boot up my laptop in the Pentagon. Don't even get me started, okay? So, and we expect to run right the, these wonderful tools on these systems. Not going to happen. It's just simply not going to happen. We have to invest in the infrastructure and the endpoint devices that allow us to literally, I mean my, okay, I'm not selling Alienware, but my Alienware <laughs> boots up from a cold dead stop in, you know, in about 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. And I've got all kinds of security on there. It's not that I've taken anything off, but that's how fast it starts up and that's what we should expect every single day. Yes, Senator Gervais. Well, I was just going to go on record and say I, I want your models. Um, we could use them. <coughs> but, you know, you made uh, some really great points um, here because, you know, if, if you think about it, I mean, you were talking about your guardians today. But when we look at right now, and, you know, I'm kind of really focused on the recruiting right now. So Gen Zers, which, mm -hmm. which you're talking about who we're recruiting. But I want to talk about Gen Ayers. Okay. These are sixth graders, sixth graders that know nothing but being completely digital mm -hmm. with it in their hand from the very beginning. Sixth graders with a six year plan already. And getting back to your point, you know, if our technology and the way we train and the way we think about things doesn't change, we are not going to be relevant to those that need to serve and we need them to serve, quite frankly. You know, and it brought me kind of back to the very first time when I looked at one of our simulations when I was at Cat T, right? And the soldiers in there on there, and I'm like, I've never seen a more sterile environment in my entire life, right? And it's in Afghanistan. And then like three minutes later, a donkey goes across, right? And I'm like, and you know, and I'm talking to the young man, and he just said, oh man, this, this stuff isn't realistic. He goes, I got better stuff back in my my barracks playing games that, you know, and so we have to really think our way through this um, going forward. <coughs> and you mentioned content, right? I think there's some things we really, really have to think our way through 
from when we talk about the metaverse and getting to this ability to interconnect, right? So uh, there's three things, three things that I always kept as almost like my watchwords with the synthetic training environments. So number one, user interface. User interface is the very first thing that if we don't get right, is the very first thing that will turn somebody away. And we'll turn them away and say, I, this won't help me. I don't wanna have to do this unless you know, you're in the army and we make you, right? <laughs> Number two, and I think this is one that really in the metaverse we've gotta think about. I always said content is king and it will be king. So how do we have the content? How is it dynamic? How do we ensure it's not stagnant? How do we ensure that it's always relevant? Okay, because if you kind of go back and look at previous um, attempts in certain areas where things that you, you just said, hey, this is cool, and it, but why didn't it take off? Okay, content wasn't there. Content wasn't there, and you didn't have the ability to generate content, right? Because look, the second thing that will turn them off is quickly, you know, and look, we've all been there because, you know, you know mm -hmm. I, I buy the device, it's really cool, okay, it's sitting over there, hadn't been unpacked because there's only like three games on it, <laughs> and it's the end, right? So, but the gaming industry, right? And now I think the fact that now we have software development kits and we're thinking our way how to do content. How to get to content um, is gonna be key and it's always gotta be relevant. Then the third, and I always said this as a synthetic training environment, I never wanted to be the Trojan horse that allowed our adversaries to come into a training environment which it had tells you almost everything about a unit their strengths and weaknesses. So it was kind of cyber. How do we make sure that we have the protection necessary? Because it's gonna be key, because look, anything, these environments that are going back and forth, and we want that, but where is the vulnerability? And then there's a second piece of this security piece that we have to think our way through. And it's just called information. How do we know what's gonna be in this metaverse is accurate? How do we build trust in what we're, we're seeing and we're operating in and then uh, and make sure that disinformation, right? Mm -hmm. That the disinformation we understand because once that credibility is lost, it's very difficult to regain it uh, on it. So, you know, I would just offer that because I mean, I think we've all kind of touched on it a little bit. Absolutely. So hopefully I got credit for like one of my questions. I don't no, know. I, no, and, and, and this is meant to be a discussion. I, again, the interoperability, and you said information, is that also considered data? And do we have access or do we have the right data? How do we create that data to continue creating the scenarios in the metaverse that we need? Any thoughts on that? Well, it, I do have a, a little pet peeve in Space Force in that, um, there are whole elements of our data infrastructure that we as Space Force individuals are not allowed to enter data into. We have to go through a vendor and then the vendor tells us, well, what, what can they prioritize? And I'm like, no, that's the opposite of what, what we want. <laughs> In fact, we want guardians to be able to put new data sets mm -hmm. into our environment. However, we will mark them accordingly, right? Yeah. You know, how trusted they are, how you know processed they are, um, you know, where they came from. And we want to um, inherently be able to walk that dog back. There should be no black box where something, some magic occurs, right? And, uh, um, so as we start incorporating AI and ML into our um, training environments and our, our um, simulation and modeling environments, we need to be able to walk that back and say, okay, this is the variable that's driving that answer and this is the data that was used and that data got a D. Oh, well, I should take that into consideration, right? I think that our, um, so, so I was an intelligence analyst for 20 years, and I think that our 
um, recruits coming in are much more savvy than we give them credit for in terms of understanding data sources. I think that perhaps, um, uh, you know, there is a generation that was not trained on kind of these untrustworthy sources because the only thing that we used were classified sources. And we thought they were valid. However, if anybody has ever worked with humans, they're gonna know that that's not a very validated, you know, <laughs> just because you paid a lot of money to get that data doesn't necessarily mean that it's um, trustworthy data. So, it's not that the concept didn't exist before, it's that we did not identify or understand it. I think, I think our recruits that are coming in do understand it. Um, but it is, it is inherent on us to be able to, you know, classify data in a way, when I say classify, I don't mean in terms of secret and top secret, which we have to do anyway, but to be able to classify data in terms of this is the source that it came from. And I have to say, you know, I walked around, I, you know, I, I was saying, wait, my steps thing only said I walked 6,000 steps. That's <laughs> impossible. It felt like 60,000 <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> but uh, I, in fact, I didn't go to the gym yesterday because I kind of really felt like I got my workout in. <laughs> but, uh, you know, fundamentally, um, we have got to, um, you know, take advantage of what folks are creating out there on the floor. And it's not just industry, it's academia. I will tell you, we have this um, uh, university consortium program uh, in Space Force. And, um, as part of that and leading that effort, I get to go around to a lot of uni universities. And there's one university in particular who literally taught me how to do an appendectomy in 20 minutes. Now they said, we're gonna teach you how to do a surgery, a real surgery, a light, you know, not a real surgery, but you know, but, but we're gonna test you on it, right? Uh, in 20 minutes, and I'm like, yeah, that's not gonna happen, right? <laughs> But the training was completely immersive. You felt the pressure as you were cutting it, you know, and it shows you exactly the markings on the body, where you need to make that incision, how deep it needs to be. You felt how deep it needed to be. So that when it was time to do the real, quote, real surgery, you didn't really even hesitate. You immediately did what you were trained to do in that very short amount of time. So think about, um, and I wanna go back to, you know, that senior leader panel I was on yesterday where uh, OSD was talking about our systems are increasingly more complex, right? The, the things that we are buying as a Department of Defense are increasingly more complex. Who's gonna run them? How are we gonna train people to run them? And so I look at models like that that are happening in academia mm -hmm. um, that were, were really perfected during COVID mm -hmm. because they had to, that because, and they didn't, we can't get time on cadavers. That was a huge issue during COVID. How are you gonna train doctors? So I look at that as a model for how we can really train very um, complex systems capabilities and, and do it quickly to create the soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, guardians that need to close the kill chain quickly. The, the question on on data it is extremely important, and I think you know as a department we've come a long way in terms of understanding the importance of data, and what how do we need to manage it? How do we need to actually tag it? 
Um, because, you know, I will tell you for too long, and we're still doing it, even with our, some of the systems we have, just because, you know, they, they met a need, but what we need them to do in the future and even today, they're just not capable because either the black box, you know, um, it's a legacy system, different reasons, right? But right now, we leave so much data on the cutting room floor. Uh, right. I'll say that. S we're not capturing it to understand exactly what it could tell us and should tell us, and we need it to tell us. You know, in, in everything from how can we do predictive maintenance, mm -hmm. right? W we have things that tell us that we should change something out at this point, right? But we don't know, do we need to really change it out at this point mm -hmm. from a life cycle perspective? So, you know, but you can see already in the commercial sector, I mean, they know. I mean, they, they have these the, the ability to know when a part is going to fail. Mm -hmm. we, we need that same ability I inside of um, the services. But we, we were challenged because we weren't capturing that data. We didn't have the monitors. We didn't have a way to understand it, nor could we understand trend analysis mm -hmm. that was um, occurring. So, to me, some of the things that we're moving in forward inside of um, as we progress to, you know, the metaverse, data is going to become extremely, extremely important. And I'm not sure we quite wrapped our heads around how do we actually manage it? Because, you know, data is data, but what we need is the data that's going to be relevant can speed our decision making in, in, in the kill chain. Because, you know, in the end, when you really think about um, the future environment um, and what we need to do, and we're seeing the tr trends, we're discussing it. I mean, I, quite frankly, the how we use gateways and translators, look, that's gotta be a way of the past. Because when you say gateway or translator, it, that just means it slows you down, mm -hmm. right? It, it, it slows you down. And so if you look at the world today and where it's going, I mean, it's ubiquitous sensing. There's a sensor, something picking up data, something doing it some with something somewhere. It doesn't matter where you are. Okay, we also have ubiquitous media and social media, mm -hmm. right? So in this, when you really look at it and everything that's happening and, and the speed, speed and relevancy and the essence of decision making mm -hmm. is really going to be the most critical part of the kill chain. Because, you know, I always said, who can sense the quickest, and who can process it, whether that's tactical edge processing to, s to get to a decision, or whether that's to disseminate it back to some area using e you know either AI machine learning and get it to a decision maker and then bring it back and distribute it to a kinetic or non-kinetic, and it doesn't matter what that platform is, whether it's my sister service here, whether it's Army, whether it's one of our coalition partners, or whether it's non-kinetic, it doesn't matter. Whoever does that the quickest is the one that's gonna win. And I think that's where everything is going as we're going forward with this. And so to me, it all starts with the data. What is the data? What are you doing with it? Is it the right data? Mm -hmm. I mean, good Lord, we have lots of data. I'm sure like the <laughs> Air Force does too. But I, I look at stuff and I go, well, when's the last time we opened that book? Why are we keeping it? it? What's it telling us, right? Mm -hmm. We have no really way to know, but we're getting close. And I think with where everything's going, we have the ability now to capture so much more information. But we have to be forward thinking and really understand. We may not understand now why we need this, but at the end of the day, if you're not even capturing it, mm -hmm. you'll never have an idea what it's gonna tell you. So I think data is, one of the most important questions in all of this, and has to be shared, has to, we have to understand how to use it. Um, because I think if you go back in history, a lot of the innovations that have occurred, mm -hmm. it has occurred because something in one field has solved a problem in some other discipline, mm -hmm. and the only reason that didn't allow it to occur sooner was because somebody didn't know about it. Right, um, so I think what we're gonna see is the essence, it's almost like a revolutionized how innovation will start to occur if we have the right ability to share data and understand what the data is telling us. And I, and I say that for, t for two reasons. Um, we Project Convergence, um, which is the big exercise, and 
it's not an exercise, it's experimentation. It's really where we bring out and we're taking some of the prototypes, the things that we're looking at as we are on the cross-functional team. But it took the scientists, it took the user, it took the vendors, it took our partners, we're all out in the dirt, right? And we're, we're, we're saying this is what we needed to do, let's see how it's doing. When we were out there, it was very interesting, like on day two, my, <coughs> my partners over in the Intel community were struggling to solve something. Okay, but they just happened to come over and see, and they go, you guys are doing that? We've been trying to solve that for 10 months. And we, well, see, we had no idea. Mm -mm. And then it solved it just like that. And so I think we'll, that we're gonna see so much more of that just because of the ability of you know being connected and being able to share information, being able to see you know some of the different ways that things can be used um, to help each other out. Absolutely, access to information and communication, everything. working together. Uh, General Prinkle, you had mentioned modeling and analysis as enabling, and I'm hearing that theme go through what General Gervais and Dr. Costa was just talking about. Can you talk about where you found success using that and how you see that will support us as we move forward with the metaverse? Uh, absolutely. Um, so modeling in SIM, uh, it's a major element mm -hmm. uh, for our digital transformation and uh, we're trying to use it as a tool, not only at the physics level mm -hmm. of representation, but uh, scaling it up to mission level and campaign level, and I'm sure that's something that's familiar to uh, General Gervais as well. And so what we're finding is that there's a little bit of a tension mm -hmm. as you develop models and uh, as we're partnering with industry to what degree do we want to develop a standardization, right? And uh, you need that in order to scale, to have them uh, most useful across the uh, widest opportunities. But at the same time, you don't want to contain or constrain innovation. And so it's uh, a constant back and forth mm -hmm. uh, in defining what are the appropriate um, modeling and SIM standards, you know, we talk a lot about, um, you know, using MBSE, SysML, and mm -hmm. Cameo, um, and those are the ones that, those are kind of the primaries uh, that we use, but at the same time, we want to see really some wide-scale uh, modeling and SIM. Um, I did want to pull a string a little bit Please. as well, if I could. Please. As we're talking about uh, leveraging gaming and the next generation and you know how can we better meet them where they are and um, there's a really neat initiative uh, that we've got going on and I brought their patch here and it's the gaming research integration for learning laboratory mm -hmm. and what their whole purpose is is to leverage technologies that are in the gaming world and try to find ways that we can capitalize on that for uh, meeting military purposes, um, building new technologies, whether they're training or other, but also for STEM purposes. So uh, one of the things, I don't know if you got to see it um, on your walk, but there is a STEM booth out there where they're using the grill uh, activities to train the next generation and they're developing all kinds of these great skills in prototyping and uh, coding and the importance of data and uh, how how you need to um, you know what how you need to uh, meta tag it and uh, store it and share it and on and on and on and it's just really exciting. I'm really proud of this grill lab and everything that they're doing. Um, uh, they have multiple things that they're looking at. For example, they've taken a, a vehicle um, simulation, a vehicle game, and they're partnering that with the uh, cognitive stress load measurements, and they're trying to adapt the game uh, as in response to what the individuals are experiencing as they go through this. Uh, they're leveraging uh, gaming engines, for example. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that in the modeling in sim world, I guess I'll tie it back to that. Um, uh, in the gaming world, for example, you use uh, Cartesian coordinates, right? And that's a very uh, simple uh, 
way to map out the world, mm -hmm. but not certainly one that we use in the military or in modeling in sim. And so being able to translate between the two, but be being able to use the gaming engines. So they've developed a couple uh, translation mechanisms that are freely available to anyone in the audience and uh, on the web. So that's a really exciting uh, opportunity to uh, take advantage of advancements that are already out there and make it better for the rest of the world. Absolutely, and, and I think that ties very nicely with Dr. Costa, having people create their own. Yep. So I assume as part of this gaming, they're learning how to create, uh, maybe even creating their own games to create and improve their skill sets. They're, they're bringing up their skills, uh, absolutely. And you know, one of the things, I, I fully agree with you, we don't want to uh, create these systems in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanna have, we wanna co-develop. Mm -hmm. And so that, that way we get the best of both worlds, right? Mm -hmm. The um, opportunity to have the uh, most cutting edge industry state of the art with uh, marrying it with folks who really understand the military mission mm -hmm. and those needs and translating it in the appropriate way. Yeah, and that's a great point I'd like to kind of just riff off of. It's really easy to do virtual reality, mm -hmm. right? Because right. nothing exists, you just make it up. It's really hard to construct reality, right? Because that's a very different challenge. You, you have to get that right. The measurements have to be right. The materials have to be right. The blast effects have to be right. There has, have to be real physics engines driving those effects. And um, uh, so, so it's easier for the gaming um, and you know companies to develop things because it doesn't really have to work as you know it would in the real world. Now that being said, gaming companies have developed incredibly great physics engines and labs and, and libraries um, uh, that work incredibly well. But their precision and having to make the world look like it actually does, mm -hmm. you know, that's a much more difficult proposition. And um, uh, we need tools, right? We need tools that help yeah. us to build those capabilities very quickly and then over time. And, and this is what I wanted to just talk a little bit about. Um, I think on the roadmap, right, the, the technical roadmap for um, getting to a metaverse is that, you know, there are gonna be some folks who only need kind of the 40% solution, and that's okay. That's absolutely perfectly okay. You're doing force design, you'd like a mix of different um, uh, elements to try to figure out, you know, what the best mix is for uh, investment. Great. Um, next step on that, is, but I, I can't train on that. That's not enough fidelity, right, mm -hmm. for me to train off of. But you know, the next step is, okay, well maybe after I've done force design, I'm gonna send it over to acquisition because I'm gonna tell acquisition I kinda need these things, but acquisition's gonna need more details. I'm gonna throw it over to training. Training's gonna kind of develop more detail, put more data on those bones, right? The flesh on the bones that they're going to now start really kind of doing that TTP development. They're gonna go back and forth. And, um, and as you're developing all the way up, the highest level is that digital twin. And you know, just like if you ask people what their definition of a metaverse is, <laughs> well, yeah, if you ask 10 people what a digital twin is, you'll get 11 answers because it, it's all over the map. But, you know, I, I take the digital twin definition to be, you know, the fact that you're using Internet of Things, real time, data infusion into that model so that that model is interacting just in, in its environment, just the way the physical model is doing. And that really 
is a much, that's kind of the nirvana, mm -hmm. right? If you were to look at the complexity, the you know, payoff and capability, it's, a, it's up there, right? But all of these things are on a path and we have to accommodate them in our technical strategies because we don't want to leave people out. Um, we want to give them left and right limits so that they can develop these models, but then they can be built on over time and developed into more detail. And I think that's very important for us as we you know, embark on this journey in DOD. And I think I, I think you wanted to add. Yeah, so um, kind of as we were looking at the synthetic training environment, so one of the things that we did find very, very useful though, uh, when you really took a look at the gaming capability that was coming out with their engines, it became a game changer, not to you know, play on words <laughs> there, meant, but you know, it became a game changer because it allowed us to create the physics for the training inside of that environment. Which, you know, we, and we have to keep in mind, gaming is not simulation, right? And, and there's a difference in, you know, what we're comfortable with. What we are comfortable with is simulation. Mm -hmm. And gaming is a different way to think about it and will offer different opportunities as we go forward. I think it's okay that we have different definitions for the metaverse. I think it's okay that we have different definitions for the digital twin because to me that's diversity, that's innovation, and that is gonna allow us to see the realm of the possible, the scale, right, uh, as we're going forward. And so when, when we're looking at the synthetic training environment and really trying to get to that level at the scale was, you know, and so we have to talk about the things that we kind of have to think our way through because, you know, it, it's gonna, it's gonna have to look at things from, you know, processing power, right? Mm -hmm. Limitation, because the processing power ne needed in one case is not the same in another, uh, according to you know, your technical roadmap. Mm -hmm. We won't have the space, and then that will limit content as we're going forward. You know, and then how do we disseminate it? You know, because quite frankly, you know, it, if you're in the metaverse and you're in the, I'm gonna call it the shopping entertainment, metaverse, mm -hmm. you know, because it's just that type of environment. A little bit of latency is probably okay. You might, you know, you may not like it, right? But I'm going to tell you right now, challenge we have when we put stuff in front of our, on our soldiers, latency is killing us. We got to have the frame rates per second because, you know, it, it is not allowing us to do what we need to do. And I'm sure, you know, you just take a pilot, right? It's going to be, uh, you, and you know, that environment's a little bit different what we have to do from the ground. And then on top of it, you know, when you think about the metaverse and that, ours is almost blended reality because what we have to do from our perspective um, as a service and, you know, the Marines have to do and we have to do it in certain use cases and other services, you know, it is live. It is live blended with, you know, augmented reality, mixed reality, whatever word you want to use, right? But we have to have that physical and that presence in the, the augmented and virtual world at the same time because, it, you know, that's how we are going to have to operate. So we're going to have to overcome some of those challenges in terms of how do you have that processing power? You know, how long does it operate? Battery, right? How do you disseminate it? How do you create that communications network? Because, you know, what we want to do, y you know, uh, we want to be able to, for a commander, you know, we're used to commanders taking a soldier um, to the training. We would like to bring the training to the commander and those soldiers, right? Uh, you know, the brick and mortar is all great, but it's also limitations in terms of that. And you mentioned the thing about flipping the switch, right? Um, we have got to have these things that are ease of use, and we cannot re you know, rely on somebody that has to come in and flip that sw switch for us because we want commanders to be able to train where they are, when they need to train, and because you know the most valuable thing that we can give a commander or a young leader is time. It is time. And right now, it's training is almost a burden. Mm -hmm. because of the resources it takes, 
everything to schedule it, how long it takes. I mean, we were talking, ours takes sometimes 180 days to plan a, a big war fighter with an unbelievable amount of resources and support structure. We were talking about a year, but think about time, time. And so as we think about it, ease of use, flipping the switch, um, but I, you know, it's incredible. I think that wide spectrum um, is incredible because it's really helping everybody inside of this understand the realm of the possible and then where it could go, um, which I find very exciting. Well, uh, if I may just add to that, the importance of time in the m potential conflict we might have in the future can't be uh, overstated because when you're talking about the scale at which things may happen, the number mm -hmm. of uh, potential activities, targets, and kill chains, and kill webs, and multi-domain, uh, time is not on our side. And so the degree to which we can solve those problems in a metaverse now will make our problem solving so much easier in the future because we aren't going to be able to predict everything and we're not going to be able to figure out all the physics of the potential of what's going to be thrown our way. And so what we need to do is just uh, build the most flexible uh, metaverses yes. that we can and uh, rinse and repeat and then just keep adapting and pushing the state of the art and not being complacent with where we are. And I know uh, this audience certainly isn't, uh, keeps pushing the state of the art, but uh, that's the one thing that will help us. So you all answered my last question before opening it up to the audience of what you could do for us. And we heard, so thank you that I didn't even <laughs> have to ask a question in rifting, but we, we heard data, we heard physics, we've heard the fidelity, the non-latency processing power, time. These are our key findings on what we need to be doing as a community together. And so th thank you. I, I was running through my questions and you just went right straight through them. But with that, I would like to open it up and we would definitely, I know you have questions. Is there anyone that would like to ask our esteemed panel? Yes, I see your hand right here. Juliana is going to come through with the microphone. Thank you. Hi, this, uh, my name is Keith Hole. I'm with Lockheed Martin, and this is directed at General Pringle. Um, the JSC is a large synthetic environment initiative that's being pushed by the Air Force and the Navy. And I want to have an understanding from you, like, how you see that fitting within the metaverse, and, and what type of technologies do we think are going to be employed within within the JSC that um, augment reality, so to speak, uh, VR, MR, XR? That's a, that's a really great question, and uh, one that uh, my team and I were discussing earlier this afternoon. So uh, JSC is really a great capability uh, right now, and of course the Air Force has assigned a program executive officer uh, to manage this and to look at how we are going to operate it at scale. How does it interoperate with other uh, simulation environments that we have? So Ms. Leah Kirkwood has been assigned that responsibility. But from a laboratory perspective, uh, we are in lockstep with JSC and we have representatives on the JSC board there's an engineering board that meets, um, gosh, I, it's either monthly or quarterly, and uh, we often talk about, um, you know, the advancements that they're making and and how do we want to see this uh, interoperate. There, there are other uh, opportunities out there as well. So I was um, uh, reviewing earlier this afternoon. Uh, the scars and you know we were talking about how is this going to uh, you know co is it coexisting where do we end up in the m near mid and far term uh, what are the you know how do they complement each other and uh, ultimately we will uh, neck it down to the best of breed at some point in the future I do agree that some portion of virtual reality, that's something we've been working on for quite some time, right? And uh, live virtual and constructive 
and knitting those together are, uh, are part of the future vision of what we would want the joint simulated environment to be and have all those elements. So uh, where we are today and where we are gonna be in the future, we're working through that, uh, that progression and um, getting to you know, what that one metaverse would be. Thank you, General Pringle. Other questions? Oh yes, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Pelag. I'm from the Israeli MOD. Uh, I'm in a committee kind of in charge of bringing the, the military metaverse uh, to our country. Um, so in the first stages of simulation, in the simulation field, we kind of felt to see the importance of interoperability and uh, in order to create multi-domain training. And we're kind of paying for that, I think, until this day, uh, trying to regulate and standardize and uh, stuff like that. So how do we learn from our mistakes in the simulation field and create a healthier process with the multiverse where we create a mutual, uh, like international infrastructure that will allow us to collaborate and work synergistically uh, in the future? And is there in all a discussion about creating an, a an international committee for this? I love that, um, and thank you for the question. Um, there are um, some organizations that are working kind of on an individual basis. Um, uh, NVIDIA has put together um, a, a working group that has over a thousand commercial members um, that are working on standards. And, and what I like um, about that particular group is that it's not focused on locking down. It's, it's focused on having a menu of options and recognizing that different functions will need different tools, different levels of detail, et cetera, and, um, and really creating an orchestrator to be able to um, display what is happening in real time regardless of whether you might be on a smartphone or you're on a supercomputer, right? I mean, these are very different things and they can support very different levels of detail and we shouldn't be stuck with necessarily one standard um, as opposed to being able to have a menu of them. And so I, I think that's the way to go. And, um, but I love um, the idea of having an international body mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and having that buy-in, especially from industry and academia. I do not, I, I cannot even go into the uh, many discussions I've had on data standards, right? Mm -hmm. Why the DOD would choose a data standard that is not a commercial data standard, I don't even understand. And so um, we do not want to repeat that with the metaverse. We want to use commercial industrial standards that um, are best of breed. Uh, so I guess what I'll add is a plug for um, you mentioned, you know, an orchestrator. And so for the Department of the Air Force, uh, the Chief Modeling and Sim Operator and, uh, you know, AFRL is supporting that, the research lab, uh, they are looking at that for different uh, appropriate standards, different purposes, but uh, I agree that we don't want to over constrain that. And I think uh, Rich Tempolsky, if you haven't met him, he is working through that, and so I'll put in a plug for him. Great, thank you. That was an excellent question. Thank you very much for bringing that forward. I believe we have time for one more question. Is there anyone else that has? The monitor says 136. <laughs> I'm gonna take every minute I have, Jules. <laughs> Mr. Torres.
Yeah, so, so I'll start um, because, you know, <coughs> a, a couple things. I mean, I think right now we are still challenged in terms of the, our, our visual displays. Um, and it, they're getting much better, but the, re the real ability for them to meet the needs um, s specifically um, from a visualization standpoint. And we're still struggling to really get to one that will meet the needs, especially from a ground perspective. But what I really think the challenge is, is how do we actually define those standards, get to agreement, right? And we're all in agreement that from the data, the integration, from the terrain, so we're all on that common, maybe operating system, is maybe a word to use, right? In time and space, that is almost affordable, right? At scale, but and it, but it leaves the ability for you know you to to be able to implement what you can, and then to be able to plug and play as it occurs, right? I think that's a big challenge. I mean, you know, the, Ar the United States Army is big. When we're trying to field this, I mean, look, we, we could have, I could have six different, sometimes even more versions of stuff that we can't afford to do at that time. But how do we actually get everybody to understand the metaverse as you just laid out from an integration interoperability standpoint and then we're all moving in that direction. You know, the phone, it took a long time. It took the internet a long time, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, th the question is how can we do it in a in a point in time that we all understand it and then we're moving at, at the right pace affordability right um, piece because that's where the challenge is going to be and then how do we also understand how do we have to change some of the business models that are out there mm -hmm. the business models because quite frankly it is a business right and some of the what's going to be vendors are going to want to do is what they're doing and what they want us to have. So, you know, that's a great question, and I didn't give you a good answer, mm -hmm. but it, it's a tough one. But I will tell you, as the commercial sector's working their way through it, we ought to be watching and working in that same direction. Because I think, you know, the best advice I ever got from one of the vendors and was, General, you just watch what we do, and don't be far behind, because you can take advantage of what we're doing, and it will help you accelerate faster than you ever would as just the army. So, uh, ladies, if you want to jump in, I, I, that's I, probably no, the most wishy-washy answer. That's but it. We're stronger <laughs> together than <laughs> we exactly. are on our own. That was exactly. a wonderful <laughs> answer. Thank you, Mr. Torres. I want to re be respectful of everyone's time. If you could, please thank me. I think this was an incredible, not thank me, thank the leaders. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, and I'm sure if you have questions, please, we have a reception later, so please come back and join us. We have one more session, I believe, after this, um, but look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you.